Before I begin, I, I'd like to ask uh, you young people down there, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Beans and eggs. Beans and eggs. Beans and eggs. And eggs. Anything else? Did anybody have anything unusual for breakfast this morning? Bagel. 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 Okay. Well, how would you like to eat some cake food? No, you all fancy eating cake food. Well, for this for this talk, I'd like you, if you would, to have your Bibles open at page. Uh, 1049, this, and follow through with me in Mark, uh, Luke even, chapter 15. <coughs> now, I used to work on the 11th floor of an office block in Nottingham, which was at the other end of the Market Square, or Slab Square, whatever you know it to, to the council house, and immediately facing the Little John clock. In the square, at every lunchtime, there's always an itinerant preacher, usually with a placard. I was back at my desk at the end of one lunchtime, hard at work, or probably more likely finishing the crossword, when a group of colleagues burst in, and they looked just like a swarm of angry bees, and they made straight for my desk, and surrounded me with angry looks on their faces. They said, your mate has pointed at us and called us pigs. <laughs> Let me first explain that anyone from the Archbishop of Canterbury to some wayward erring vicar who appeared in the paper, in fact to anyone who said or done, did anything to do with Christianity was classed as my mate. <laughs> However, this did sound strange. So I asked them what the street evangelist had actually said. He said that we're all in a pig pen. <laughs> the light dawned. So I looked back down at my crossword and said, well, he's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine the comments. They're unrepeatable. But I knew then that I'd got them hooked. My mate's direct comment, whoever he was, enabled me to tell them the story of the prodigal son and what it meant. God works in mysterious ways. So let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would use your word and my words to see what's going on in Luke chapter 15. But Father, both I and those who hear need your Holy Spirit to be our interpreter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In a moment, we're going to be looking at that parable of the prodigal son. But before we do, I'd like you to put this story in context. I can ask you, if you've got your Bibles open, to look at Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They thought that they and only they were good enough by keeping the rules and making duty a religion. So Jesus told them a parable about a lost sheep. When a one in a hundred sheep is found, it was a time for rejoicing, to which everyone there, including the Pharisees, must have agreed. But look at verse 7. Jesus said, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Everyone there must have agreed, even the Pharisees. But that's what the point he was making. Jesus continues about a lost coin. Again, rejoicing when it's found. Everyone must have agreed. But verse 10 tells us the point of that one. In the same way, I tell you that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He was building up to this parable that we're going to look at today, which is called the parable of the lost son in your Bibles. Or the versions of prodigal son. And prodigal, the word means wastefully extravagant. In one sense, it's too narrow a title because it's actually about three people. 
If you look at verse 11 where it starts, Jesus continued, there's a man who had two sons. It's about three people, not just one prodigal son. But let's look first at that younger son. Bearing in mind that those listening to the story first time didn't know, like we do, how it unfolds. So as we read it, please try and hold that and the reactions it may have caused then in your minds. The son says to his father, give me my share of the estate. Now that must have been a considerable amount. We find out later there were lands and servants involved. The son didn't say, please can we discuss having my share of the estate, but give me my share. The commandments say, honour your father and your mother. Not much honour there. The father didn't argue. He divided his property between them. Even in today's culture, we recognise that the son was behaving badly. However, we could overlook the significance of honour and shame and family relationships that existed at that time and in many cultures today. Even today, in some religions, they would cut off someone outside the family of becoming a Christian or marrying outside their culture, bringing shame on the family. In one sense, later on, it would have been quite normal for this man to divide his estate between his two sons, and then they would take care of him in his old age. There's no welfare state then, don't remember. But that wasn't the plan here, because the son must have sold off his share of the land quickly, probably at a loss and set off with the bright lights. He ran away. I remember Sylvia telling me of her younger brother, who aged about 10, decided to run away. He went off with a suitcase containing a pair of pyjamas and a handkerchief, (laughs) and was back by tea time. (laughs) In this case, however, the son would have been virtually been saying, I don't care about your welfare. I don't care what happens to the family estate. He would be spitting in the face of his heritage and striking a blow at what the family stood for and bring shame on his father. In that first century Jewish culture, it would have been really shameful to turn his back on the land which the Lord God had given his people. Those listeners at the time would have been horrified and disgusted. But then, much worse. The son travels to a distant country, out of reach. And instead of wisely investing his money, he squandered his wealth in wild living. Again, shock, horror for those listeners. But then his money ran out. And worse, there was a famine. The listeners would have thought, well, he got what he deserved. The Pharisees especially would have probably looked at each other and said, well, that's what you get for not keeping the rules. He was that hungry that he got a job feeding the pigs. The crowd must have groaned out loud, definitely not kosher for a Jew to associate with pigs. But worse, he longed to eat the pig food. When I was a young boy, a few years ago, he, he was a man in our village, he used to come round with a handcart, which had two metal dustbins on it. He collected food scraps to take home, boil up and feed to his pigs. Now there was a twitchel, or ginnel, or alley, whatever you call where we come from, with high walls next to it, where this chap, just over the wall, used to boil up his stuff. It was known and respectfully by the adults as the twitchel. To us kids it was known as Pig Squill Alley. (laughs) It actually stank. It led downhill to the lower road. The trick was to take a deep breath, run the length of this, before breathing again. It was okay downhill, but coming back hill, you had to take a big gasp of air halfway, it was awful. But this chap was so hungry, he wanted to eat the food, he was desperate. Serves him right, the listeners must have thought. But let's look at Jesus' words in verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll 
I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your, like your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. His father met him running down the road. Look at those words in verse 20. The, those listening and note would have thought, oh, he's going to get his comeuppance now. He'll be rejected. But it says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion for him, he ran, most unusual in those times, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. Most of us, if you read fairy tales or stories, there's a saying at the end of them, and they all live happily ever, ever, ever after. after. But that's just fairy tales. There are three people in this parable, as it says in verse 11, and there's an older son to consider. Before we take a look at his reaction, just consider that at the beginning of chapter 15, we meet the Pharisees muttering about Jesus mixing with sinners. Here in this parable, we've already seen that the younger son has admitted to this sin before heaven. The Jews at that time would not even utter God's name. Hence, that's why he says heaven. He is a sinner who repented, who turned round and went back the way. What was it in verses 7 and 10 that Jesus would cause a party and rejoicing in heaven? There's no doubt in my mind that the eldest son's reaction echoes that of the Pharisees. It says the eldest son was out in the field and asked a servant what was going on with the music and dancing. When he was told what was happening, he got angry and refused to go in. In front of the servants, that was a public rebuke an open rebellion against his father, as bad as what the younger son had done in the first place. It brought shame on the family. He, as the eldest son, was supposed to be by tradition to be fully supported by the father, especially publicly. But his father goes out to plead with him. But what follows is a tirade of abuse and lack of love. In fact, there's hatred in those words. If you listen to it, he answered his father, look, all those years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, came comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. I've never worked for you, not as a son, but as a slave. You never gave me anything, even though I kept all the rules. This son of yours, and you couldn't even call him his brother, this sinner, the elder son was far from home. And as his father, even as his, the younger son, happy. But the father's response, my son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Those listening Pharisees must have realised that this reaction really portrayed in the account of the older son must be directed at them. The anger they must have felt towards Jesus must have increased and would one day end in cries of crucify. What's really the picture, the story of this parable? Let's now consider the father and all he said and didn't say. He didn't argue with his younger son. He let him go. He gave him his choice. It was a risk. And he must have lost standing in his in respect in his community. He showed that he was overjoyed to receive his son back. It was a risk again in the eyes of the community. He should have sent him packing down the road. He would have lost face with what he did. 
as it was now, he lost his eldest son, even though he pleaded with him. He gave his homecoming, a son, a robe and sandals and a ring and a party, rejoicing. Even then, we don't know how that all ended, because being in a family doesn't necessarily carry rules, but it does carry obligations to meet all the requirements of family life. This parable is about grace, pure grace. There's a chorus we now sing, I don't know whether you do it over here in, in here, but we've heard it go, and it, it's like this. I'll get told off by Sylvia again, because she couldn't sleep the other night for it going round her head after I sang to her. <laughs> but we will, you'll know it, it's grace is when God gives us the things we don't deserve. I can't do it, but my singing voice is very good. It's that grace is when God gives us the things we don't deserve. He does it because he loves us. He does it because he loves us. Grace is when God gives us the things we don't deserve. This younger son didn't deserve one thing. The parable wasn't really to hammer the Pharisees. It was really to show them what a loving God they and we have. If they would have realised it and repented themselves, there would have been that party in heaven for them. Grace wasn't something we only hear about in the New Testament. The Pharisees would have known the Scriptures. They would know that it says in the Old Testament the words, but you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow in anger and abounding in love. They would have known it because that phrase, or something very close to it, appears eight times in the Old Testament. They knew it, but they didn't live it. I like one definition of grace. It's unconditional kindness giving, given to an undeserving recipient at an uncomfortable cost. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So costly. I have an admission to make. I was a prodigal. Although I had a church upbringing from birth and knew all those rules and regulations and many restrictions went, that went with church life, I can't really say that I really knew Jesus for myself. Age 16, I rebelled and ran. Apart from getting married, didn't have anything more to do with church. I was in a distant land for almost 20 years. When I realised my state and realised I was far from home and cried out for help and God came running to meet me on the road. The details of that are part of another story. You see, my mate in Slab Square, whoever he was, was right. There are only three places in life to be. Far from home, in the pig pen, realising our need and on the way home, and being welcomed and part of a loving family. Because I've realised the truth. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There's nothing we can do to make God love us less. It's called grace. I want to borrow an expression I heard my daughter-in-law Libby using when telling my granddaughter to do, to, to, to do with something she'd found, something she'd gained. She said, Adelaide, you should pay it forward. Pay it forward. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a loving God. Thank you that we can read about that very fact in, in the Bible. Thank you that you can, we can experience that in our lives. And we pray today for all those that we know, all those that are basically in the pig pen, that Lord, they realise where they are, that you use us to help them to find their way back home to you. And Father, we pray you bless us this day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. <coughs>